Uh, my name is uh, Scott Heiniger. I'm with the University of Wyoming uh, Cooperative Extension Service. And uh, I'm located up in Sheridan. I do have handouts. I'm not going to hand them out right now. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do is I'm going to go over the highlights. Uh, but everything I'm going to go over is going to be in a little more detail uh, with the handouts. Uh, but if you do want to take notes as we go along, you know, feel free uh, to do that. Um, but one of the things before we kind of get started that I'd like to do, uh, since it, we're uh, coming off after lunch, and the lunch, the speaker that's after lunch always has the hardest time getting everybody's attention and whatnot. So, could I have everybody stand up? Yes. We're going to do something. So, if we get everybody to stand up, and if everybody will say three times, ho, 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 okay? Ho, ho, ho. All right, now if you'll raise your hands up and go, he, 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 he. Now let's put it together. Ho, 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 he, he, he. All right, now you can sit down. So now, now look around. Now, now look around at everybody. Does, does, it, does everybody have a smile on their face? So, all right, so now we're, we're all in a good mood. We're all happy. Uh, so now we can kind of move on. And that's the, that's the way I'd like to proceed uh, with the rest of today's program is we want to have fun, and what I want to show you and, and kind of talk about is season extenders and why and how we can do that in Wyoming. So if, now that we've kind of broken the ice here with everybody, um, why, why do we want to look at season extenders? We have a short season. Why, why do we have to? Well, if we want to have any uh, vegetables later on in the season. Yummy. Yeah. Yummy, okay. What, <laughs> yummy? What, what, what's that? Give us the opportunity to grow things we can't normally yeah. grow in things. four, three, five, whatever you're in. Okay. Greater utilization of your plot. Greater utilization of your plot. Grow things in uh, a season where things aren't readily available. Okay. So if we want to look at a different timing that, than what we normally can? They said it much nicer than I did. Okay. What, what, what is, uh, what's one of the, the major things that we face in Wyoming uh, for growing a garden? Freezing temperatures. Freezing temp when do we have freezing temperatures? <laughs> May? <laughs> June? August. August? Okay, freezing temperatures. That's... That's one limiting factor. What's another limiting factor we may have? Water and wind. Water. Oh, we have wind in Wyoming? Yeah. Oh, wind, wind can affect our vegetables? Okay. Do we, what else do you guys have down here that we typically don't have a lot of? Variable, variable temperatures. Variable temperatures. I'm going to cover that and hail. hail yeah. one of the, that's one of the, we have a lot of obstacles in raising uh, gardens or vegetables. Um, in Wyoming. So what I'm going to go through uh, some of the basics of why. And I'm going to explain from a, kind of a scientific standpoint why. And then we're going to talk and I'm going to show you some examples of how. And then what that's going to kind of lead into uh, is the next presentation that Jeff will be doing on hoop houses. So it's kind of a, a lead in to what he's doing. Uh, but we have recognized that we do have some limitations here in Wyoming as far as growing things. And to kind of explain or to expand on that, then what we want to do is kind of look at some things. Um, so this could be April. We could have ice on our plants in April. Could we have frost on some of our vegetables in May? Yep. How about June? We, yeah. we, you know, it'd be nice if we had a tomato that was that size in June. Yeah. Uh, but how about our pole beans in uh, September? You know, this yeah. could happen to us. Okay, what about October? Well, you know, we're trying to harvest our pumpkins maybe in October. But what about <laughs> November, you know? <laughs> it, it's like, oh, geez, we're done with our growing season. So what I want to look at it... Um, what if I were to tell you um, that what I can show you here today, I can extend your growing season by 30 days. Would that be of benefit? Yeah. Yeah. What if I said that I can show you ways 
with hardly any cost that I could extend your growing season by 60 days. Do you think that's possible? What about if I said 90 days? Almost double. What if I said I could double your growing season without much of a cost? Huh? Do you think that would be of benefit and of interest to you? Okay. Well, we'll, we'll look at, at that as our goal to see how long uh, we can extend our growing season. Now, um, one of the things that we had talked about just a minute ago that was brought up is air temperature. We all know that air temperature affects our vegetables, right? So if we look at a minimum, the optimal, and the max temperature for some of our crops, uh, peas, okay? I see my table didn't get corrected this morning like I uh, thought I had corrected it. Uh, this is the minimum temperature, the optimum temperature, and the max temperature. So the minimum temperature for peas from an air standpoint we can go down to 38 degrees. So we, most of us know if we've been growing vegetables that peas is what we consider a cool season crop, right? They can stand a little bit of a light frost, some cool nights. They really kind of like that. Uh, but we also know they really don't like a real high temperature. So there's an upper end. That's one of the reasons why we look at growing peas in the spring. And when we get talking about extending our growing season, uh, we'll look at uh, the other part of that. Okay, another one of our crops, cucumbers. Uh, they like a lot warmer air temperature. So now we talked about the fluctuation of air temperature, cooler at night, warmer during the day. If that nighttime temperature drops down below 48, the cucumbers are going to struggle, right? But the cucumbers like a lot warmer weather. They can go up to 105 degrees on this table. Typically, we look at growing cucumbers during the middle of our growing season or the summer part of our growing season. Peppers, I see that this one didn't get corrected like I did. The, I thought I had it done this morning, but it didn't. Anyway, peppers, uh, 60 degrees, warmer than cucumbers, a lot warmer than peas. It likes this 70 to 80 degree time frame, but 95 to 100 degrees. Corn. Okay, why do we grow corn in the summertime and why does corn like warm weather? Well, it doesn't like cold temperature and it really prefers our summertime temperatures in Wyoming. It really likes warm weather. So that's the physiology of some of these plants. So if we understand from an air temperature standpoint what the uh, restrictions or uh, the boundaries of some of our vegetables. Now, in the handout I have, I list a lot of other plants uh, from that standpoint. But from an air temperature standpoint, uh, and then I see that went off the table. Below corn, Below corn yeah, my uh, uh, tomatoes. Uh, let me tell you about tomatoes here. <laughs> tomatoes. Uh, it's interesting, when I was working on this this morning, that all looked fine. Uh, tomatoes is between 50 and 55 degrees, um, 60 to 80 degrees optimum, and 85 to 95 degrees. So tomatoes like warm weather, but not near as warm as uh, corn. And so one of the problems that we run into, uh, particularly uh, with a lot of our vegetables, is if we start exceeding these numbers here, what happens? They stop fruiting. What, what, uh, from a physiology standpoint, uh, the temp whatever the temperature is for that particular plant, they're not all the same as you see, but that's why if the temperature gets above, say, 95 degrees with tomatoes, those blossoms, they'll blossom but they won't set fruit typically, or it's, or it's really difficult for them to set fruit at that point. Um, so if we know some of those limitations, then that can help us um, with some of our uh, gardening ideas. Now, the other thing that we need to look at is our soil temperatures. It's one thing, like today, to have nice soil temperatures, and I see this one's gonna end up being the same way. <laughs> I thought I had saved that, but I missed it. 
All right. Um, let's look at peas. Uh, the optimum uh, or the minimum soil temperature for peas is 34 to 36 degrees. Can we grow peas in the ground today? I would probably say we probably could. One of the things that I recommend to people, if you're really wanting to start pushing the envelope a little bit, but if you really want to be more successful at your gardening, is to get a soil probe, a soil temperature gauge. They're not very expensive. And what you want to do is measure the soil at about a six inch depth. And these temperatures now, <clears throat> here's the table. So the tables aren't messed up like what this is. So, so the tables that I have for you are a lot more readable. The um, peas, you can see that once the ground basically thaws out, we can start planting peas. So we could be actually starting to plant peas now, probably, outside, um, and be somewhat successful from that standpoint. If we look at melons, melons need to be warmer, 55 to 60 degrees. There's a huge difference between planting peas and melons, right? Peppers, 55 to 60 degrees. Corn, 60 to 65 degrees. And tomatoes is 50 to 55 degrees. Now, the point that I want to make with this is that a lot of us, it's human nature. We get a nice warm day like today, and it's like, let's charge forward, okay? Hey, it's a nice sunny day. I don't have to wear a coat, sun shining. Let's make hay while the sun shines, right? Well, we can get by with that today with peas. But I'll guarantee you one thing. If you were to plant any of these crops here, when this soil temperature is not at at least 50 degrees, yeah, they may grow. They may, let me put it this way, they may stay alive. But they're not going to grow optimally, and they're not going to produce and that's why a lot of times if you, see, if you see people that get in a hurry and they put their tomatoes out and they just kind of sit there and then you wait like a week or two weeks and set them out and they just take off and go, this is probably the reason. There's two things that I get questions asked all the time about. One is why aren't my tomatoes growing and then how come they're not producing like my neighbors? And that just drives us nuts. You know, why is someone successful and someone isn't successful from that standpoint? The two reasons that you run into this, one is the air temperature at night, not necessarily during the day, but then the soil temperature. So if we wait for the soil temperature to warm up, that means that we have to wait longer in the year, right? I'm going to show you some techniques here in a little bit that we can warm that soil temperature up. And then once you've got the soil warmed up, you know, by using your thermometer, then you can plant these other crops and get them in a week, two weeks, or longer ahead of everybody else. So the question was, okay, we, maybe we want to grow some of these off season from when everybody else is, you know? Do we want to have, uh, as my father-in-law always used to tell me there in Sheridan that uh, you wanted to have your corn knee high by the 4th of July? Well, if you were to do this, we could be picking corn by the 4th of July, not have it knee high. So if you were to look at some of these things and do some season extenders, uh, we can reach that, okay? The other thing that we talk about a lot of time is transplants. When do we want to start our transplants and when do we want to get them out? But there's some plants that do a lot better at being transplanted than others. Um, some of us like to move to somewhere else a lot easier and other people go, you know, I'm not moving, I don't care. <laughs> I'm just not gonna move. You know, there's some things that, that you can transplant that really doesn't mind it. You know, broccoli, lettuce, peppers, tomatoes, cabbage. You know, those are real easy to transplant. They go, eh, no big deal. You know, we, yeah, transplant me today, transplant me tomorrow, I'm happy, you know. Just give me a little water and food and I'm good to go. Now, if we get into like beets, carrots, some melons, um, corn, squash, they can be transplanted. You need to have a little more care with them. When you start getting into melons, squash, your vine crops, they start getting a little bit finicky when you start messing with their root system. Uh, they're a little temperamental sometimes when you mess with the root system. If you have a really well-developed root system in the pot, 
they'll do a lot better. But if they're a little bit of a marginal root system in that pot, they may really struggle from a transplant uh, standpoint. Okay, some things that really don't like to be transplanted, beans, peas, radishes. But as we'll show here in a minute, uh, those we typically plant from seed and, and they have a short growing season, so it's not a big deal. We just plant them, sow them from seed, and, and we're good to go. Um, so the take-home point here is some things do better transplanted, some things don't. Now let's look at what I call some short season vegetables. And now we'll take spinach for example. It takes between 45 and 50 days to reach maturity from when you plant it from seed. Now this is just an average. And the thing that I want to bring home is as we go through a list of a few of these, this just kind of gives you an idea when you're doing your planning that it kind of gives you a starting point. But the thing that you're going to want to look for on a package of seeds or wherever you're buying uh, your vegetable seeds is look for the days to maturity. And that's one of the things that we talk about in extension is in Wyoming, because we've got a short growing season, you don't want 100 and day 20 corn necessarily. If you can get a 65 day corn, then you're going to be probably more successful. You won't have to worry about uh, if we have a late frost to get them frosted in the spring or that late frost in the fall or that early frost in the fall where we might not be able to get it harvested. So a lot of times we look at short season um, maturity and that's what we mean by a short season is that it has a short or a less number of days to maturity. Radishes, you know, you're looking at less than a month from planting to picking. Beets, a little bit longer, you're looking at almost two months. Carrots are a little bit longer, and this is really going to depend on, now if you're wanting like baby carrots, or if, you know, the other scenario along this line is, um, uh, on a lot of these crops that we see here is when we thin them out, you know, typically we overplant. <laughs> And so when we go every other one and pick them out, so you're picking them at a younger age, but a lot of times those work really good for greens and salads and just casual eating kind of a thing. So uh, you, it's, it doesn't mean that you're not eating carrots for 70 days. It just means if you want the full size carrot, you may have to wait 70 days for that. Green onions, about a month. So my take home message as we go through this, is plant early, plant late, and plant often. And if we kind of think about that as we go through this, it'll make a lot more sense. Typically, I think what a lot of people do in gardening is they go, okay, I'm going to plant May 25th. And so they plant your cool season stuff. And then June 1st, you start planting all of your warm season things, and then you're done. Well, you've missed half the growing season if that's what you do. And, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, one of the, uh, I've been at this for a long time. <laughs> you can see the gray hair. I've been at this, maybe not as long as some of you, but I've been at it for a while. Uh, one of the interesting stories I like to tell about spinach, when I first started uh, doing a little bit of uh, educational programming with gardening, uh, one of the people that had gardened for years and years and years and years and years and years and years there in Sheridan had told me that they had planted spinach outside of July and August. They've planted spinach every month out of the year, and they've harvested, over the years, they've harvested spinach every month out of the year. And that's not using any kind of uh, a hoop house or greenhouse, but it's just, um, spinach is one of those interesting crops, as we'll see, that if you get a warm day like today, you're picking spinach. Um, and you can, you know, plant a little bit in February and a little bit in March and a little bit in October and a little bit in November. And if you happen to have four or five days of warm weather like this, you'll pick a little bit of spinach. And then if it drops off really cold, then kind of goes back to sleep. But um, some of these crops you can, you can get by with. And then if you give them any kind of protection at all, they, you can get a lot of production. Okay. Uh, on our longer season crops, uh, pole beans, 108 days, corn, 70 to 90 days, but that's really going to vary. I mean, there's a large variation with corn. 
from that particular standpoint. Oh, uh, one point that I need to make with corn is that um, if you get into the super sweet varieties of sweet corn, not just sweet corn, but the super sweet or, or those hybrid varieties, those varieties are really sensitive to soil temperature and nighttime temperature. And so you can get by with field corn or just regular sweet corn, and you can kind of push that envelope on the low end. Um, but a lot of times where I've, and I've even experienced it myself, where I've planted a row of super sweet, and I tried to get it in too early, and nothing germinated. I mean, I didn't have one plant germinate. And then where I'd planted a, a different variety that wasn't a super sweet, it came up and grew. Some of those are really that sensitive by four or five degrees. You wouldn't think it'd make that much difference, but if you're pushing that envelope, some of those varieties can do that. Melons is a little bit longer season. Peppers, you know, a lot of times we're, um, on some of the varieties of peppers, we're out there 125 days. Potatoes, between 80 and 140 days. And then my tomatoes, now we're down there about, um, hundred and twenty five days but a lot of that really has to depend on the type of tomato that we're doing if we're if we're growing the uh, um, the cherry tomatoes or the little uh, tomatoes those are a little bit quicker than some of the beef stick type tomatoes uh, but what what I want to show here though is that a lot of these crops that we want to try to grow in Wyoming it takes a longer growing season in some places in Wyoming as I'll show you there's a we just can't grow it unless we give it some extra help or whatnot. So the question back here is, well, how do we grow that 120-day um, corn or 140-day potato? You know, if you want a really big one. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have to help them out uh, to, to be able to get those number of days. So that's all things that uh, we know. Now... Uh, this is Jeff's garden uh, last week. Uh, <laughs> yes? No? No. No. All right. Okay. So this isn't Jeff's garden. All right. So what I want to talk a little bit on this, and I've got a different handout uh, chart with this, is to look at, and I've alluded to it uh, already, is what I call succession planting. All right. So as you can kind of see here, we have some greens and some onions, and then there's some other area here. What if we were to go in, and, and if our goal is to maximize the amount of garden produce that we can grow, okay, on a given square footage piece of ground, without a lot of effort, but some effort, a little additional effort. Okay, one of the things that we can do is we can buy some of that information I showed you, like with spinach and peas, radishes, uh, that like a cooler season that can grow in cooler soils, cooler nighttime temperatures and whatnot, we can plant those and we can start planting some of those the end of March, uh, first of April. We're gonna get 20 to 40 days when we can start harvesting some of those. Well, the other thing that we can do is you can, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can do here. So you can plant your lettuce or spinach. When that's done, then plant you know, when it starts to bolt, get old, plowed up, plant some new. Or you can plant half of this row this week and then wait a week or two weeks and then plant the other part of the row. And so then it's staged out. So you're harvesting over a longer period of time. That's what a lot of these uh, um, community assisted gardens do, the CSAs, where you buy shares into the co-op. And so every week you get so much produce. It's the same principle that they do. They plant uh, on a series, and that's what like I do with my corn. I'll plant uh, a, sh a short season, a mid-season, and maybe a little bit longer season, and you can do that all at once, so then they're uh, coming mature at different times. Or, you know, if you're just doing one or two varieties, you can do one row uh, this week and then wait a week and plant another row. But the other thing that you can do is you can say, okay, I'm going to plant lettuce here. When the lettuce is done, then we should be long enough into the season. I'm going to use that space to plant my potatoes, my tomatoes, 
or maybe that's where I'll end up putting the corn. You know, so we've waited, we've harvested that area. Now we're going to reuse it for a different crop. So that's what I kind of mean from that standpoint. But the other thing, you know, we, we typically think about the springtime. We can do the same thing in the fall. So we can plant this into spinach or lettuce, get one or two crops off of it in the spring, plant it to potatoes or corn. There's nothing to say that once the corn, potatoes, tomatoes are done, or our melons, that you can't plow that up and then go back in and replant your spinach, your lettuce, um, carrots, and get and have those go through and you get 30 or 40 days and then when they're done you plow it up and then plant them again. So you could actually get two crops in the spring and two crops in the fall of our cool season crops without a lot of extra uh, expense or, or too much because a lot of times what we know if we can get by a couple of those frosts in the spring and a couple of those frosts in the fall our season's considerably extended. But if we, don't, if we don't do something to help the plants out to keep them from getting frosted in the spring or the fall, then that's when we lose our tomatoes. Because, you know, tomatoes, they have absolutely no sense of humor when it comes to cold weather. You know, they're, it's like, okay, you said it's going to get down cold. I don't care if it really does or not. I'm just, I'm just not going to do anything. You know, they just have no sense of humor. So... So I said, you know, you can start early and replant. Uh, you can plant over several weeks. Uh, you can use the same area later for warm season crops, and then we can replant in the fall. So these are all techniques or ideas that some of us have explored and others really haven't thought a whole lot about. You know, I think a lot of times people, by the time August, September rolls around and you finish with the garden, you're kind of like, eh, I'm kind of done for the season, so I'm going to go hunting or fishing or whatever your activities are. Uh, but we're really probably missing half of our growing season if, if that's the time frame that we stop at. Now, I've alluded to this, what I'm calling winter gardening, um, but if we look at onions, uh, they can go down to zero degrees. Have anybody ever just kind of in the fall just covered your onions up? And then you just go out all winter long and you pick them. Have any of you tried that? That's one way to do it. I mean, you can, if you cover it up where you can get out there where the ground doesn't freeze, your onions don't care too much. But, you know, they're really cold tolerant. Now, this is the air temperature. Parsley, spinach, Swiss chard. Rat, okay, Swiss chard, radishes. Now we're at 10 uh, degrees. All of this stuff, these tables that I've got is out of a book called Knott's Handbook for Vegetable Growers. But here's just a list. I've got a, a bigger list in here uh, of some of these. But as you can see, uh, you can really get down to some pretty cold temperatures for some of these crops and be successful. Now, if the ground's not froze, like what I'd mentioned with spinach, you know, if you plant up on the south or the west side of your house in November... December, where it warms up during the day, as long as you water it. <laughs> you, is that air temperature? That's air temperature. That's not ground temperature. That's air temperature. So they can go down to zero. I mean, they prefer it warmer than that. I mean, you're not going to get a lot of growth. You know, this would be the nighttime tint low. You're not going to get a lot of growth, but... What are you covering in there? I'll show you. Okay. Good question. I'll, I'll show you here. Um, and, and basically, it boils down to your imagination to some degree. But there, there are some, some commercial products out there that uh, work really well. Now, uh, I struggled with this table. And uh, <clears throat> PowerPoint got the better of me. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's going to be a little busy. Uh, but what I want to do is, is to kind of show you... Um, some temperatures. Now this information is out of the Wyoming Ag Statistics, so I didn't come up with it myself. Uh, 32 degrees is what we would call a light frost, 28 degrees is what we would call a heavy frost. The, thing, the first thing I want to show you is that there's a huge variability on where you live. 
let's take Sheridan for example. This, this really throws people when they ask me, said, what's the average frost temperature in Sheridan? I go, well, where do you live? And they go, well, what do you mean, where do you live? Isn't it the same? And I go, no, it's a lot different. It depends on if you're up at the airport, which is up on the hill, or if you're down at the experiment station down in the valley next to the river. So if we look at 50 per, okay, let's say 90%, that means that April 29th, there's a 90% chance that by April 29th, the temperature is going to drop to 32 degrees. If we look at, and that's at the experiment station that's low, um, if we look at the airport, that's May 2nd. So if, they, if someone asked me, what's, the, what's our average frost? If it's a light frost, then I'll say it's May 27th to, to May 20th. Um, and then we can look at the same thing over here in the fall. Um, we can look at uh, September 26th to October 1st. So uh, you gain about a, a week or so there, and uh, there's about a week difference there. So, you know, there's you know, two to three weeks difference in Sheridan, whether you're up on the hill or you're down low. And we know that cold air sinks, right? So there's a variation of almost a month uh, if we just look at the average. But somebody says, what's our frost free date? There's a difference between what's our average freeze and what our frost free. Now, if you've lived in Wyoming long enough, you know that there is really no frost free date uh, per se. It depends on where you're at, but, uh, uh, but you, you know, somebody says, well, what's our frost free date? And I go, well, it's June 24th in Sheridan. And they go, you're kidding me. And I go, no, that would be considered our frost free date. But if you lived up on the airport, it's June 1st or June 6th. Well, that's a huge difference. Uh, if you want to consider a frost free date, you know, that's almost a month in and of, it, of itself. Um, now, if we look at Torrington, uh, someone was asking me uh, earlier about, well, how does Sheridan compare uh, here in Torrington? Well, I was kind of surprised that if we look at uh, May 15th uh, to uh, September 20th is similar uh, to Sheridan. Uh, and then if we look over here in the fall, uh, the 29th, uh, May 3rd, um, Pretty similar, and I would have thought that Torrington would have had a lot longer growing season than Sheridan, but according to ag statistics, uh, if you look at the average, there's not that much difference, but there's a larger spread. Uh, you can go October 11th and up to uh, May 1st. So if we were just to play, roll the dice, okay, what's the weather going to be like this year? You roll the dice, there's a lot of variation, okay? If we look at the variation May 1st to May 30th, well, there's a month there if we look at the variation here in Torrington, or um, if we look at September 11th to September 20th for a light frost or a heavy freeze, we're looking uh, over here. So this table's in here, but what this does show us, though, is that we've got, you know, 100, 125 days or so growing season. So now we've looked at, okay, what's the growing season for some of the crops? What are some of the requirements for some of the crops? Here's our temperature. But then you can look at um, what the weather patterns are, um, you know, look at the national forecast, weather forecast on what they're predicting or NOAA, or you can read the Farmer's Almanac, or you can call Jeff and he can get on his magic ball and tell you when the spring frost is going to be this spring I'll send you the, I'll send you the sky. yeah just send me the sky so so we can get we, we we can get the astrological charts out or do whatever um and but you know every year is going to vary i mean when we talk about an average that it it never usually hits that particular day it's usually either before or after and so the thing that i want to bring up is we're looking at an average typically uh you know, I don't know enough about the climate down in this part of the state to judge uh, from a, uh, a folklore or, or um, 
experience. Uh, one of the other things that one of the people that had gardened for years and years that had grown up in Sheridan had told us is if you look up on the face of the bighorns and uh, where the there's a, a dirt road that goes up on the bighorns is just right out of Bighorn, uh, Wyoming. You can see it from Sheridan, but where the road gets up basically on the top of the face of the mountain, that's called Red Grade, uh, where we live. But when the snow's gone off of Red Grade, then that basically means now we're into this area here of our average frost, because when the snow's off the mountain, we're less likely to get a frost down below. I've kind of looked at it over the years, and that's a pretty good rule of thumb to kind of go by. So some of this stuff that you hear locally from people that have gardened and whatnot, some of that bears out. I mean, it, you know, when, whenever something happens, you know, the, the birds or when the birds start coming back or something like that, you know, they're looking at the weather also kind of a thing. So there, there is some truth behind some of those kinds of things. Uh, but this table kind of gives you an idea of what you're working with. So now we get into um, the why on this. <clears throat> so we've talked about, okay, our growing season's short. Our temperatures fluctuate. Sometimes, depending on where you're at, you have to deal with winds. Uh, you know, the, the thing about some of our weather and, and animals is like, gee, I can go the whole season, have a successful garden, and then one night or one afternoon, either the deer come in or the raccoons come in, or we get a hailstorm, and it's like, wow, that was discouraging. Um, the... <laughs> That, that, that's one word that may not have been the word you were looking for either. <laughs> but, you know, the other thing that we can look at, uh, as I'll show you with some of these techniques, is we can control some of those. We can look at controlling some insects. And, you know, most everywhere I've gone in Wyoming, we have to deal with wildlife. So... Uh, that can be an issue. So let's talk about how are we going to do that. How, let's look at some different techniques here. I'll go through a list here. We can do hot beds, cold frames, walls, different kinds of caps, row covers, greenhouses, and hoop house. Now, I'm going to show some examples of these first four, but greenhouses and hoop houses is another story, and Jeff's going to tell us once upon a time in Torrington, uh, there was a man that put up hoop houses. So that'll be coming up later uh, today. But let's look at some of these examples uh, here. Uh, are you guys familiar with these walls of water product? Uh, the idea there with these is uh, several fold. First of all, they're going to keep the wind off of these young plants, right? So they're going to they're going to benefit from that. Uh, the second thing is these walls of water are filled with water, hence their name. Uh, but during the day, that water heats up. So at night, not only does it heat the ground, so if you're going to, typically these are mainly used for like tomatoes. You can use them for anything. It doesn't matter what it is, but they're mainly promoted for tomatoes. You put these out before you plant your tomatoes so it warms up the soil to get it up to that 50, 55 degrees. Then you just pull the cover up, plant your tomato, put that back around it, and you're good to go. But what that does is that alleviates a lot of the fluctuation of temperatures. Um, but by doing that, you can get probably two, three weeks easy in the spring time. Uh, doesn't work quite so well in the fall. Why would that be? Your plants are too big. Your plants are too big, yeah. These aren't big enough. All right, now, for, for some of us that have uh, an addiction to liter bottles, or if you have kids that 
like liter bottles. You can make little mini greenhouses. Same kind of thing. Doesn't cost you much. All it does is you need to cut the tops out. Uh, you can either do it that way. The other thing that you can do is instead of cutting the tops off, cut the bottom out and set it on. And then during the day, you can unscrew the cap and let the warm, if it gets too warm, uh, from that standpoint. You know, here's an example of you can use a half gallon or gallon size uh, containers. They make different products, these caps. You can buy commercial ones. Uh, there's kind of a teepee type. There's a bell-shaped type. Oh, another thing that I was going to mention, there's research out there that shows that um, um, plants like to absorb different wavelengths of light. Tomatoes like red. You'll actually get more fruit production if, if there's a red reflection around tomatoes. Uh, and I think it's also pepper. So if you look in the, lit in the catalogs, you'll see the red walls of water or you'll see the red plastic that you, that you can put down in between the rows or whatnot. Uh, there's some research that shows that you'll get an added uh, production by using a red fabric or red material around a lot of your um, vegetables, but particularly tomatoes really like red. Uh, another good use for uh, milk cartons, you can do the same thing with milk carton. You know, the advantage there is that's a little bigger container, so you can let the plants grow up. Uh, now, this is what I was talking about. You can either, you know, depending on tomato, tomato, however you want to pronounce it, but uh, when we're talking about uh, cold frames or hotbeds, five minutes, ten, ten minutes, um, these are the types of things that we're talking about. So you can, you can make them small, you can make them big. I've seen people that have gone to auctions and have bought the windows out of somebody's house. And so you just use the window as this top part and you just build a frame around it. So you can put these on the south or the west side. The other advantage to these kinds of things is they're not very big typically. So if you have a small area you know, these work really well early in the year, later in the year. Uh, usually they're hinged. Uh, you just put a little piano hinge, so you just fold it up during the day so it doesn't get too hot, and then at night you can drop it down. That also kind of keeps the cats and raccoons out of it to some extent. Uh, you know, there's different shapes, you know, and they're kind of like the uh, chicken tractors. You can get them fairly cheap or pretty elaborate. Um, you know, from that standpoint. <clears throat> now, when I was talking about row covers, this is what I mean by row covers, and I've got a couple other examples of pictures that I'm going to show you, but it's a material, it's a weave material, and you can buy these in different widths, different lengths, uh, and different thicknesses. Now, the thicker they are, um, the more heat they'll hold in, uh, but the, this, isn't, this isn't like plastic wrap, okay? This is a fabric, so it breathes. Um, but it really makes a huge uh, advantage on um, holding the temperature in. This will work on keeping uh, insects out. It helps with hail protection, uh, but it warms up underneath there. Would you use that mainly to get the soil warmer in the spring before you plant? Or both. Also you can use it for both. And the light? The light penetrates. Um, now, if you get the heavier material, what they call like a frost blanket, that doesn't let as much light in. Um, but the lighter weight material, you can see through. And can so you it through that? You can, but it, it's, it, you know, it, it's not like a lot of it's going to run off. So you, so you might pull that off during What I do, what I do is I like to do drip irrigation. So I run my drip down through there underneath so it doesn't matter at that point What's it made out of? it's a fabric it's just a spun it's woven uh no it's a synthetic it no it's a synthetic fabric is it kind of like shopping bags you would stick the grease in a shopping bag no it's kind of like the stuff you buy dog food and cat food in it's like it's kind of like it's got that fabric 
it, yeah, it's a, it's a breathable mesh fabric. Um, I, don't, I don't think you brought a piece, did you? No. And I, I didn't either. Now, um, let me show you a couple. Of, before we run out of time, I want to allow a little bit of time for questions. You can, you can do this fabric in different ways. So here they've just taken some material and made hoops. The advantage of this is, is your plants can get up taller, you know, foot, two foot tall uh, from that standpoint. Um, and then this picture kind of shows some different things. Now this technique here is what I've been doing with my tomatoes. What I do is I've got, you can, whatever you're going to use to cage your tomatoes with, I take this spun fabric, I plant the, or I warm it up, you know, set it out there for about a week, and then I plant my transplanted tomatoes in there, and then I put the fabric around the top, and I put a little bit over the top of it, and then when I go to water, then I pull the top off, pour the water down the top, put the top on until it gets warm, and then I just pull the top off um, from that standpoint. But I wait till my tomatoes get all the way to the top and they're just literally full. This whole thing will just be solid uh, before I pull that off. Um, and then after that, I mean, they've got a root system and off, off to the racetracks they go. The other thing that I've done is you can use like these raised beds. The raised beds um, help warm up the soil. So that's part of the idea with a raised bed. Uh, but you can use this kind of a design early and late, particularly with your, ro your vines. Uh, cucumbers and whatnot work really well from that standpoint. One of the things that I've done with corn is I've built a little frame that's about a foot wide with uh, some wire that goes over the top 15, 20 foot long. So I put, I plant my, or I put that out where I want the rows of corn at. Let that sit there for a week to warm up the soil. Then I go in and I plant my corn underneath there, put those back on top, and then I wait till the corn gets to the top of them, then I pull them off, and they're off and ready to go. I can get a couple weeks start. Uh, but there's a lot of different techniques from that particular standpoint. You know, here's that woven material again. Um, the woven material, or you can get this windbreak material if you're in kind of a windy location, particularly when your plants are young. You want to kind of protect them from the wind. Uh, so there's uh, things along that line. Or you can do a combination. Uh, the advantage of having uh, kind of a finer type fabric, uh, first of all, it's going to keep a lot of your wildlife out. But if you have that fabric on, particularly if you go over the top of it with, that'll keep some of the birds out. And it'll also help to some degree with hail. Uh, so there's some advantages. Uh, with things along that line. Or, if you wanted to, you could get uh, the Jedi Gnome. And he's been known that if, if you get the Jedi Gnome and you put him in your garden, then he's going to keep all of the bad things away. So you'll have a very successful garden uh, from that particular standpoint. But um, when it's warm enough. So what you want to be doing is looking at... Um, you know, the temperatures that, that's in, that I've got listed in here. And, um, and so you just kind of want uh, to do that. Now, another technique that you can kind of do uh, with this fabric is once it starts getting warm, you can just take a pocket knife and cut slits or holes in it, and that lets more air through. Uh, the uh, you'll probably get more better light dispersion if you have the milky type because it's going to deflect the light more so than just the straight clear. Uh, one of the problems you will run into a little bit with the clear though, uh, that sun can get pretty intense during the middle of the day. So I'd be better off with the milk carton. Possibly, but what I'm wanting to show you there is your imagination is your limit. You know, you can take rocks and put big rocks around your plants. They absorb the heat during the day, give it off at night. You can take milk jugs and fill them with water and set those around your plants. 
they heat up during the day. Um, so there's, there's just a whole host of those kinds of things that you can do that if you do that, you can get another 30 to 60 days growing season. Now, if you want to get into the 90 day growing season, then Jeff's going to tell you after I'm done how you do that with a hoop house. So. Organic, anything organic. I mean, and that's personal preference. If you wanted, um, even the inorganic works. I mean, if you want to use rock, gravel, that's going to heat up. But I prefer the inorganic, the uh, grass clippings, wood chips, hay, straw, anything along that line breaks down. And Scott, can you tell us so which of these or which combinations of these things you talked about are going to give us this double of our any of, any, really? any of these products here, if you do so, something like that, you'll, you'll, you can easily double your growing season without much expense. And, if, and so basically, because if you have this frame set up, you can protect the plants in the spring, but then in the fall, like your tomatoes, if you put that fabric back on in the fall at night, then it'll protect from a light frost. Now, the tomatoes, if it gets into that 28 degrees, even the frost blankets aren't gonna work very well there. Um, but when you get into the hoop houses where you got a lot more volume, they hold a lot more heat in in the fall, so you can go a lot longer. Thanks, Scott.